One, two, testing. Yep. Fingers crossed. Julian. Hello. Hello. How are you? Not so bad. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Oh, brilliant. Too well, Is that too loud? No, no, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, jolly good. How the devil are you? I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah, really good. Thanks. Yeah, how are you? Yeah, it's not so bad. I'm struggling on. You know, I'm a lot older than you are, so I'm slowing down a bit. But um... I don't. I don't know about a lot, Roger. Actually, <laughs> sure about that. Are you broadcasting from Salisbury? Uh, yes, at home in Salisbury. Yeah. So uh, there we go. Just um, well, well, we're having a chat, and we'll uh, well, you know, how it goes. We'll have a chat, and I'll edit it and put the music yeah. in and broadcast yeah. either on the Imaginarium or the Walls and Carpenter. It depends okay. on, on stuff, really. Right. So we know how that goes. So um, we'll just have a chat about that. And I see you got your Make Love Not War sign up. We'll talk about that as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, uh, if, if I call you Julian by mistake, because we should stick yeah. Blake really, as this is uh, your... Oh, so. It's quick and confusing. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> right. Uh, now then, Blake. So now the last time we spoke, uh, it was your uh, album, The Book on Love, uh, issued by Subjanga Records. You've got that lovely Penguin cover on the special edition CD, which sold pretty quickly, I think. How do you feel about that looking back next? It must be over a year. Yeah. Um, yes, it, 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 it did sell. And um, uh, I've um, had quite a few people, you know, asking me for copies of the CD. But the, the thing is with... Um, you know, they, these really are limited edition CDs that Subjungle put out. So once they're gone, that that's it. And um, yeah, so I, I was delighted with that, and um, I was very happy um, with the album as a whole. Um, yeah, you know, it kind of took me by surprise, really, because I, I recorded it at home uh, in a completely different way to this latest. Uh, uh, album playing songs that i've got coming out soon um so it was something that i you know just did in my little home studio um so so i was pleased that it came out as as well as it did you know and it, and it was received as, as well as it was yeah no excellent and that was a good album i loved it i played it a lot at the time obviously and we did. Chatted Thank you. about it um yeah now since then you've you've put odd things out on your um Bandcamp page, little thing you covered a bit of status quo and you re revisited some early material. Um, but what's led then to the creation of this uh, new album, Plain Songs? And what was the thinking? Does it have a concept behind that title? Because Plain Song can mean something in early music. Yes, yes well, that's right. Yeah. So it's, it's a bit of a play on words because, yes, it, it certainly um, does refer to, uh, you know, that, that early music and the, indeed one of the tracks on the album is uh you know recorded as such a kind of um reminiscent of um monks chanting you know um but also it was it was to do with the fact that um that the the album was recorded uh on analog tape at uh, a studio in in bristol um you know, mostly live uh, and and therefore it was a reference to the fact that it was you know it was really the, the songs without much um uh, you know uh, adornment uh, uh, in terms of you know overdubs and um you know i did i didn't want to kind of uh, obsessively uh, overthink um the these songs i just wanted to to get them down in the studio as quickly as possible um uh, because i wanted to try and capture the you know the um the the the, the live energy uh, of my band playing them live and, and we'd rehearse them all before we went into the studio so the plain songs thing is that you know they're, they're just plain songs without um you know as i say um without too much of, embellishment or overdub that's the word yes yeah, exactly yeah. Yes, yes. so now so that's a very different experience than the way you recorded the last album as you've said i mean was it a lot of fun doing the new album then with the band live yeah. in the studio sort of thing absolutely it was loads of fun uh, although you know of course it's it's really quite uh, quite challenging because you you know the tape's really expensive <laughs> so you don't want, you don't want to have um too many takes and of course it wears out i mean you know as you know um so um you know you you try and uh, get a good take as, as soon as you can um so there's you know there's an element of, of challenge to that 
Um, but uh, yeah, re really good fun. And, and as I say, we, we'd rehearsed before we went into the studio, so we, we, we knew the songs really well. Mm. And, and and generally, they, you know, they went down in uh, two or three takes. Yeah, brilliant. Oh, and the reel to reel stuff that must have been lovely to play with all that kit as well, all that analog equipment. What a oh yeah, what a dream. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's a dream. It's a dream, you know, um, Studer uh, machine, you know, uh, you know, as used by the Beatles. I mean, not the machine, mm. sadly, but I mean, the, the type of uh, uh, equipment that, you know, was used to record, you know, the, all, all those classic albums of the 60s. So um, it's fantastic, you know, and then, you know, the engineers like rewinding the tape and you hear that funny <laughs> noise. <you know? laughs> yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's great fun. Um, yeah, so it's, and it's also, you know, it's very tangible. I mean, the thing about, um, you know, recording at home on my own, you know, I'm using Logic, I'm on, a, you know, on my laptop. Mm. Um, and, it, you know, it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't feel like making music. It's more like, you know, programming or something. Whereas, you know, if you're in a studio and you, you've just got this guy operating this massive machine with, you know, big tape on it. And you're in the studio with your guitars, drums and, you know, and it just feels like, you know, what you should be doing as a musician. <laughs> Yeah, now wonderful. Now you said you were rehearsing the songs before you went into the studio, and you said the other day when we were sort of setting this meeting up that you were at band practice. Um, so, I mean, are the songs therefore live, ready to go, and going to form part of your gigs pretty soon? Because I think you're at Liverpool before too long, aren't you? A couple of weeks. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we're playing at the Cabin Club on Saturday, the third of June, as part of the International Pop Popa Throw Festival, and very honoured to have been invited back to perform again this year uh, as we did last year by um david bash who 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 runs the the festival and, and um yeah so uh, we were rehearsing because yeah we were rehearsing these songs that we've recorded and uh, uh we'll be performing them live uh, on stage at the cavern uh, on that date so um yeah we just had to you know polish up on them um but yeah i'm really looking forward to performing them to an audience yeah, lovely stuff. Now, the, the title um, of the album, Plain Songs, is also reflected in one of the tracks on the album, isn't it? Because you've got Plain Song, A Jesus Help Me, or is it Jesus Save Me? I might have got that wrong. Oh, it's, uh, yeah, Plain Song um, linked into uh, Hear Me Jesus. Hear me. So, um, it, you know, it starts off with this uh, medieval plain chant, and then it segues into this uh, this kind of heavy rock song. Um, and, you know, the inspiration behind that was... Um, you know, that, that, that thing that, uh, you know, George Harrison did with kind of, you know, um, Eastern music, you know, Indian classical music and um, and and, and, that, and then that synthesis, you know, with with Western rock um, and, and, and that was obviously taken up by uh, Cooler Shaker in the 90s, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, and I've always liked that kind of um, juxtaposition of um religious music and secular music you know and it's kind of like a you know a gospel tradition as well i suppose um it, it, you know it um that 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 kind of blue spiritual thing uh you know sunhouse and those those early uh, uh bl blues artists uh were, 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 you know were, were mining in that tradition um so uh yeah it, it was just something you know that the would always appeal to me it's got an element of a kind of jesus christ superstar uh soundtrack um in, in that as well you know um yeah and just you've also the, got that the, the jesus saves me bit as you say all, all gospel but also that's part of the blues isn't it as well big part of the blues yeah. uh, you know yeah, that exactly. religious vibe yeah 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 that's right um so yeah i mean that's um very much you know su 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 sun house was um you know writing a, a lot of songs in that vein um yeah so it's kind of like that that tradition really and, uh, I, and I didn't really hear that you know so I, I i i thought it was like at least something different you know yeah yeah no but lovely track i mean i love all the different influences there. i'm all i'm i'm always up for a bit of chanting and stuff actually i mean it was about the beatles <laughs> but the bgs on their first album had a bit of gregorian chant almost on oh, one really? of their tracks didn't they so um Yes, every Christian lion-hearted man from the Bee Gees. Uh, check it out, you see. Was, right. it, yeah, they were they were very very an underrated band in some ways, but not as great as the yeah. Bee Gees, but pretty good. I do know. I, I've heard I've heard some uh, early Bee Gees stuff, and yeah, I, I really like it. Yeah, ignore the seventies. It's the it's the six <laughs> it's the sixty seven <laughs> to sixty eight stuff, Reed. Yeah. Now, um, okay, so the title track, Plain Songs, and uh, that is got, got all those wonderful mixture of things, but there's quite a variety of musical styles on the album. 
um, which mm. which is a good thing because you get that's what the Beatles were so good at, weren't they? You mentioned. Well, indeed. Indeed. Um, now the track that you put out first and you've done a film with it um, is uh, "Make Love Not War." Yeah. So why did you choose to put that one out first? Was that particularly at the forefront of your mind when you were working on the album, or you just thought, "Oh, this works as a, a track"? Well, we, we the the thing was that um, I mean I thought it was kind of like you know a pertinent message. I mean. Obviously, it's a bit of a cliche, but, you know, since it was adopted in the 60s, you know, it's it's still sadly relevant, isn't it? You know, mm. that that message. So, um, you, know, you know, I mean, you know, I'm obsessed with the 60s. So, you know, that whole peace and love thing, uh, it very much appeals to me, um, you know, musically as well. So I, I did kind of kind of go all out on the, the 60s vibe with that one. Um, but as I say, I, you know, I thought it was, a, you know, also a... A, a message that's still relevant so um and, and it kind of lends itself to um you know kind of you know that kind of lenin-esque kind of um give peace a chance power to the people type yeah. you know sloganeering uh so i thought it might be a, a catchy one to um to lead off the album with you know. yeah yeah no well i mean you know, you're taking me back to my school days now at the end of the 60s but i remember doing a school assembly i had charge of a school assembly and i wrote to uh, apple and got uh, a couple of those john lennon posters really when war Amazing. is over yeah well i've got so i've got the i've got a war is over genuine war is over poster somewhere really? in a wardrobe from 1969 <laughs> yeah it's well, very cool <laughs> yeah, yeah it just again it just shows how old i am julian but <laughs> I'm, je I'm jealous that, that that's amazing right so that was it yeah make love not war put that out in a, a video to support it as well now at the moment the album's not out that's lined up for release next month isn't it uh it's actually uh yes next month why we're still in may aren't we yes so it's uh yeah uh friday the 2nd of june so yeah, yeah not long to go not long um, to go so at the no. moment though it's, it's on Bandcamp, and there are two tracks that people can sample that's uh, right. Thing of the album. Now, one of them is um, uh, "Make Love Not War." Yes. Uh, now, the other one, I've got the names completely escaped me now, but I've played it already. A couple. Uh, of time times. for a change. Yeah. yeah now, the moment you say that, I can hear it in my head. You see, that's a good <laughs> sign. <isn't it? laughs> yeah. So yes, that was um, that. That's uh, that's probably my favourite track on the album because uh, you know, it feels like a a good three minute pop song to me and. Um, I, I I really like um, the uh, guitar solo that um, guitarist in the band the uh, Paul Kench plays, and uh, yeah, I just I was really 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 happy with that song. It's a kind of catchy little ditty. Yeah, no, it is. It no, and it's still the fact that you, you say you once you reminded me of the title, it was instantly there in my brain. It's a nice little track, yeah. and you know, there's a little bit of of jangle effect to the sort of little guitar riff that's going through it all the time, isn't there? Which is rather nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it certainly was. You know, we we uh, were conscious about um, having a nice kind of uh, jangle sound on on that one. Uh, we, you know, it lended itself to that. Um, yeah, so the, yeah, it came came together very easily when we were arranging that, and it was it was very very easy to record. I mean, I suppose that's an example of you know the whole you know just playing songs um, ethos, if if you will. Yeah, and. Uh... Well, in, in terms of some of the arrangements and so forth, because, I mean, I haven't heard the album enough. I haven't played it enough to know every yeah. song really well. But, sure. I mean, amongst some of those songs, you've got the rock side covered. And yeah. but there are also songs where the arrangement is very straightforward. It, it's just you and guitar and maybe a bell in the background going on on, on, on some of those tracks, on one of those. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's Rainbow's End, where there's, uh, which features uh, some tubular bells. Um Bit of a Michael Oldfield influence on on that one, uh, uh, along with the analog synth that uh, my friend uh, Richard Kilby plays. Um, so yeah, I was kind of I, when I wrote that song, I thought you know it did remind me a bit of um, Mike Oldfield, so uh, that's why those elements are in there. In that well, nothing, nothing wrong with that. You see, you're talking about the you're talking about the sixties, but early seventies was still a yeah. phenomenal period for music development and. Uh, uh, Mike Oldfield did some fabulous stuff, and yes, did. I mean, there's the, some of those bands as well. But uh, that's right. Yes, Mike Oldfield laid down a bit of a template with uh, tubular bells, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. I, I um, I, I uh, <laughs> I went on a bit of a Mike Oldfield pilgrimage uh, a few years ago, and uh, 
dragged my my, my wife along. You know, we were trying, we went to Hergis Ridge, and I was I was trying to find his his house. You know, and I um <laughs> I dragged my wife and my yeah my daughter was about two at the time. You know, up this mountain. You know, trying to find Mike's house, and uh, <laughs> she wasn't as excited about the whole experience as I was. Uh, and did you find his house in the end? Yeah, I did actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah from a distance, there it is. Um, <laughs> to walk down again, but no, I mean, he apparently used to go out there and fly his kite, you know, and um, you know, if he escaped from uh, all the madness of uh, the, the the music scene, the, the success of Tubular Bells, you know, and uh, yeah, I don't know if you've read his um, autobiography, but very interesting. Yeah, no, I can't, I can't say I have, but I have got quite a few of the albums from Tubular Bells to, well, some of those mid-80s uh, ones at least. But, um, um, yeah, certainly Tubular Bells, Umma Gumma was a great album. Love that as well. Not Umma Gumma, that's Pink Floyd. Um, oh, um, oh, uh, yes. Um, exactly. was, uh, um, was a great album. Love that with all the, the yeah. drumming in it. And uh, there was, what, was the dub, what was the double one with... Um, Incantations. Incantations, yeah, which was good but a bit long and they did a live version of it on tubular bells 2000 or something oh, right. um, with maddie prior i think doing the doing the vocal bit and i thought that was better live actually i thought that really oh, okay. worked very well but yeah there we I go saw, i recently saw a um we're digressing now aren't we? but <laughs> I, I saw, I saw my fault <laughs> <laughs> i saw mike performing uh tubular bells um i think it was performance from about 79 or something like that on um on youtube recently you know when he performed it live. Um, I can't remember who was the other guitarist, who, um, famous guitarist who played them. Um, but that, yeah, that was an excellent performance. I, I know it's it's touring again at the moment, but he's not involved in the production, sadly. Mm, yeah, well, he's he, he must be older than I am. So there you go. Um, right. So yeah, no. So back to to playing songs. That was a bit of a diversion. Sorry about that. But uh, <laughs> um, that. <laughs> now, amongst the, sort of all the influences that are sort of encapsulated on your new album, there's a bit of a country uh, vibe as well. Are you into country music? Because you've got Sweet Country Lady. We've got a bit of steel guitar on that, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, my friend uh, Richard Kilby again plays uh, lap steel on that. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit of, I suppose it's more of a kind of um, stones or uh, faces pastiche you know that that song in a way originally it was uh, it was called west country lady uh but then i thought you know <laughs> i thought it was quite funny but people might not get the joke and um you know i was thinking of you know singing it in a kind of west country accent but i know that was that was a terrible idea um i think but, that yeah goes down very well in certain parts wouldn't it? <laughs> do it proper bristlodian <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, uh, but yeah, so that's kind of, um, yeah, I mean, I, the thing is with the guys that I play with in the band, uh, they're such good musicians, you know, that, that, um, uh, Paul was able to kind of emulate that kind of, um, mm. Keith Richards slide thing, you know, honky tonk women type thing. And, um, yeah, again, it just, it just came together very, very quickly and it turned into this, this thing. Uh, um, similarly with, um, Siren Song, which is, I suppose, got more of a velvet underground kind of vibe to it um you know i just had a simple acoustic demo of that but when we began rehearsing it, it you know it turned into this kind of um five minute opus you know with this uh this bit at the end uh that you know um goes a bit crazy uh and it was great you know it's, it's lovely that when that kind of magic happens you know when, when you're playing music with other people and it just goes in the direction that you hadn't originally thought about yeah no the, yes the ma that's the thing about music isn't it those magic moments that you can't explain but sometimes just happen it's just yeah incredible. exactly now yeah, so who is in the band now then because you've mentioned a few musicians i mean we yeah. all establish who's in your band and who's uh, sort of going up to liverpool with you yeah um so um so i've mentioned paul he's the uh lead guitarist and um he, he's he's in the band um but my um my friend joe Brown, who plays uh, bass and also a very talented harmony singer and keyboard player, he's uh, he's coming too. Um, and on drums, um, my friend Hugh, who I've been playing with since I was sixteen and he was thirteen or something like that, <laughs> school <laughs> friends and uh, still playing together. So um, yeah, we know each other really, really well, you know. Um, and I think that that has helped you know with the um 
you know, to create those kind of magic moments that we we're talking about, you know, because uh, I, I think I think it's not just playing with any musicians, you know, I think particularly when you know people really well and uh, and we've been playing you know, in, uh, in bands for many, many years. So, um, yeah, I think there's something m magic about the four of us, you know, getting together and playing. Mm. So when the mood is right, you sort of all know what one another's, well, you're not inside each other's minds exactly, but you do have a good understanding of what other people are going to do. And if someone goes off for something, steps yeah. out a bit, there, then the others are there to support. And, well, that's how those magic moments happen, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And I, I think, you know, think about bands that I really like, whether it's, you know, Led Zeppelin or the, or the Beatles, you know, there's that kind of, uh, there is something about those combination of musicians, isn't it? You know, playing together and then, you know, John Bonham no longer being there, and it, he's kind of irreplaceable, isn't he? Do you know what I mean? It's in terms of the sound, in, in some ways. Well, yeah, no, absolutely. It's the same as the Beatles splitting, for example. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, they were still great and all the rest of it, yeah. but it wasn't the same. It no. wasn't the same. The music was um, was was different in in so many ways. They did miss one another, although I can understand that was quite a marriage from the early 60s to 60s. Yeah. They probably were yeah. sick to death of one another by the end, but there was yeah. a magic between them, even though they didn't do live performances anymore, you know, that um, yeah, when the yeah. moment came and they were on Abbey Road roof, whatever, they were, they were banned again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I totally agree. Mm. So now, apart from um, the cavern, then are you gigging locally and stuff at the moment with with Blake as the, a band? Um, so uh, yes, um, I've got a I kind of got a secret show uh, organised. So I shouldn't really say too much about that because it's supposed to be a secret. So that's basically for um, you know people who kind of been following uh my music and uh and, and who i know would be interested in going or hopefully be interested in going um so that's kind of like um a little show we're, we're we're doing uh locally um and um but we as a group have said that you know what we'd like to do now is is, is get on the road and, and 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 start booking more gigs because it's been so much fun um recording this album uh, and we're well rehearsed now and uh, we just, yeah, we just like to uh, perform to as many people as possible. Yeah, that, lovely. Well, I mean, following from the Book on Love album and then this one coming along as well, um, and your music getting, uh, you know, your following is growing, so to speak. I mean, putting out a lot of that material on Subjangle Records must have really helped, sort of, because I play stuff from before those albums. There's particular tracks I really like, like Kaleidoscope and things like that. I play that a lot. Um, but the, doing that, did that give you a sort of baseline to think, move on from this point? Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really honoured to be, um, you know, asked to be involved with uh, with Subjangle, and they've got some incredible artists, uh, you know, on their roster. Um, as, it's like with the International Pop Overthrow Festival. I mean, when I was there last year, the, you know, the quality of the acts is it's unbelievable. There's bands like the, the Real People and Lim Price Three performing there you know really top bands um and and similarly with some of the acts on uh subjangle well, well all of the acts on subjangle actually um so yes i mean it, it's uh it's it's elevated <laughs> my status as it were mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, by association uh with the, with the other acts on the label um and and then that's been brilliant you know and, and, and uh, as a result of that you know um my music has gained you know so much more expo exposure um and yes I, I don't know whether you know you, you'd have come across my music without it being associated with the label roger i don't know well i think i mean i mean a couple of things you've said there i I'm, i mean absolutely there is so much really good music being put out by the independents yeah. with artists like yourself and kevin up in aberdeen and all absolutely. the rest of it there's just so much brilliant music coming out but uh, yeah. how do you find that music as a listener that's the mm -hmm. thing. I think being associated with something like Subjangle or Big Stir mm -hmm. Records or Freedom Air, that does mm -hmm. help enormously because they've been around a bit. They know what they're doing. And um, yes, it's much harder, I think, just on your own. How do you get your music out there? So I think recording for some of those independents who do a fantastic job. They do. They do. And it's, a, you know, it's a labour of love. And I'm sure, you know, there's there's, there's no profit involved. Um, but it, these are people who really care about music. And I, you know, without them, um, you know, I think you know, the music industry might not be in such a great position, but because they're, you know, they're encouraging and promoting 
um, you know, grassroots music. And, and as you say, there, there is so much quality out there. Um, that, but without these people to pr promote it and, and radio shows like yours, you know, who are, um, you know, taking the risk of playing, you know, unsigned acts uh, because, you know, you like the stuff. I mean, you know, we, we all owe you a great debt of gratitude, you know, because, um, yeah, without it, you know, uh, it's very difficult to to, um, to get anywhere above the noise, you know, because uh, the internet is, uh, is a busy place. <laughs> yes, there, there, there is a lot of stuff out there. That's <laughs> true. Um, but anyway, well, we all have our small part to play. That's, um, I suppose with Rock Radio UK, I mean, artists get, we play quite a few, well, obviously we play artists that we like, that's what it's about, but then other people might pick them up but all those plays get registered and recorded and it all adds to the uh, i know people will notice i, I would hope but uh, there we go yeah. um so now with the new album plain songs we, you had a special cd edition of uh, the book on love as we've discussed how is um the new album plain songs going to be available so it's going to be available on CD, um, again, uh, limited uh, edition run of 100 copies. Um, so the, the pre-order is available now. So um, if, if uh, any listeners are interested, just visit uh, thisisblake.bandcamp.com and um, they, they can place a, a pre-order. Uh, and as I say, I mean, once they're, they're gone, they, they, they will be gone. Um, but it'll come in a nice, attractive um, digipack booklet with... Um, uh, I mean, I won't give it away, but there's some, there's some nice um, packaging involved with this, oh, lovely. Uh, which ties in with the uh, the, the, the plain songs uh, theme. So, uh, yeah, I hope people will enjoy that. Yeah, no, lovely. I mean, it, interesting CDs are making a comeback because everybody went vinyl mad. The independents kept vinyl going for a long time, and then they were saying, "Oh, we have everything on vinyl," so all the big boys took over. Now the independents are focusing on CDs, and of course, the quality of the CD is fabulous. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I buy I buy records, but I also buy a lot of CDs. And uh, when I'm sitting talking to you now, I'm surrounded by uh, CDs. And uh, yeah, I mean, I th I just for me, you know, it's just having uh, that that physical uh, copy of something, whether it is a record or CD or even a cassette. Um, yeah, I think that's for me. Uh, I just uh, I I know of people who you know traded their CDs in when Spotify came around or whatever, and uh, um, I don't know, people regretted doing that. <laughs> yeah, it's mad, mad. Well, you see, I know people who, when CDs came out, they were taking their vinyl to the dump. Yeah. I mean, come on, for goodness know. sake. But anyway, there we go. They mustn't get on yeah. those horses, must we? <laughs> uh, right, so, yeah, so the new album's going to be available on CD, and uh, that's going to be, I look forward to, to seeing how that's uh, presented as well. And um, so CD playing songs you've got the band there now i think this is, is it dedicated to your grandfather and his passing or uh, it's actually my it's actually my father uh, oh, right. sort of passed away um in january and, and i don't know whether i told you the story before uh roger i, you know, I tell everyone the story but it was, it was my dad interviewed john lennon in um, 1969 he was a reporter and um he, he interviewed john when he was doing the uh, bedding for peace at the amsterdam hilton um was in was in Toronto, might have been in Toronto. Um, one of the two, you know, he was in a ho he was in a hotel bed uh, with Yoko. Yeah, I remember it. Yeah, yeah. live piece yeah. in Toronto and all that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was to do with you know the um, uh, the ATV uh, takeover of uh, Northern Songs, and uh, it, 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 he was interviewing him about that. But the only thing you can remember John saying to him uh, when he came onto the phone. Uh, John said, "Hello, Birmingham." But he said it in a he said it in a Brummy accent, which I'm, which I'm not going to do. But um, yeah, that's that's all my dad can remember about the conversation really, and it was just quite frustrating for me as a kind of young Beatles fan. <laughs> what else did he say, Dad? Hello, Birmingham. It's a great claim to fame, though, isn't it? I mean, in interview John <laughs> and Blimey O'Reilly. That's great. That is. <laughs> yeah, and funnily enough, I um, I. Um, when Mark Lewison was doing his uh, Hornsey Road tour, you know, talking about Abbey Road, after the talk, I um, I had a chat with him, and I mentioned that to him that my dad had interviewed John, and he said, and I gave him the circumstances. He said, oh, "What was his name?" I said, uh, "Oh, Calvin Pugsley." He said, "Oh yes, I remember." He said, "I uh, I looked him up. Um, I looked up that story in the British Library on microfiche or something like that. You know, this guy's." Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Beatles knowledge is so incredible that he actually even remembered, you know, my dad's small part of uh, John's yeah. history. Yeah, part part of history. I've just had a warning that our meeting may end soon, so we'll see how we go. Oh, I've got I've got nine minutes left. Right, I think I've got I've got enough for um, putting a nice little sequence together. Is there a track in particular you'd like to draw my attention to that you know, struck you as something as you're recording it? Oh, I really like this or whatever, um, or something that you may think may not get the exposure because of its arrangement or whatever. Anything you'd like me to pick on particularly? Uh, yeah, thanks, um, Roger. If, um, if you if you're happy to play uh, Siren's song, you know it's it, it's perhaps something that wouldn't generally be played on a radio show because of its uh, its length. I mean, I think it's in as to say like four and a half five minutes. But um, I know I know. I mean, listen to your show. I know that you you you'll play you know the tracks from the beginning, um, psychedelic rock tracks that go on for six minutes. So I know you have that you have no trouble with that that kind of thing. So yeah, maybe that would be great if you wouldn't mind playing uh, Siren Song. And that that that's that's a song that uh, we like playing as a band because it's got a lot of dynamic shifts in it. Yeah, oh, lovely. Happy to do that. Okay, now that's brilliant. Now I was going to say to you, did you have you seen yet the Brian Jones documentary on BBC Two? Yes, I have. Yeah, because I mean, I know that because Bill Wyman was so entertaining, wasn't he? But uh, yeah, it was a great, a great um, social history. And having been around at the time as I was, it sort of brought a lot of things back to me. What a time the 1960s were, all that change in music, technology and the, you know, the drug scene as well. It was a phenomenal period. But there That's were quite a few damaged people about John Lennon, I'd say, was a damaged mm -hmm. individual. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian Jones certainly was, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. And I lived in Cheltenham for many years, so you know I was always aware of you know Brian's kind of ghost in in the town, mm -hmm. and um, you know he he's certainly the, the the stone that I admire, you know probably most you know as as a musician, you know just because he was he was so experimental, you know and he had, he could you know turn his hand to anything, couldn't he? He could, yeah. And, and uh, yeah, an interesting character, but like you say, you know very damaged and. Uh, you know, I wonder whether, you know, these days people would get the support, you know, for someone like that with addiction issues and, and perhaps, um, you know, mental health, self-esteem issues. I mean, I don't think there was those kind of networks of support. Well, it, was, it, was very, it was still a, it was still quite stiff upper lip, I think. But yeah. um, it's interesting, he was talking about how bands are, you know, the sum of the individuals. We were talking about that because I think when Brian Jones was there, he may not have been a songwriter. But he added mm. so much in terms of colour, absolutely. Uh, Instrument to all those tracks, you know, with two aftermath. And I mean, I love Satanic Majesty's Request. I know that's not everybody's Stones favorite album, but I, uh, there is there is a flaw. It's a flawed album, but there's some absolutely brilliant stuff on there as well. Yeah, that's right. And uh, what's uh, do, do Brian's playing Mellotron, isn't he? On um, she's she's a rainbow. And it's an incredible. Yeah. Part. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I I I love that period, the Brian Brian period, and like you say, you know, uh, that. Well, aftermath. I think that's a that's a fantastic one. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, I did I recorded a '60s scene today, and it was May 1966. And aftermath, there are so many people recording songs from that album. Yeah, it was like a Beatles album for the Stones. You know, everybody yeah. was to which song to cover and all the rest of it. That's um, right. A lot of them didn't make the charts, but they were after their songs. So it was a fantastic time for them, really. But there we go. Chris Farlow out of time. Wasn't it? Yeah, and and think he did as well. He did think before that. Uh, yeah. And uh, Lady, um, yeah, Lady Jane was covered by a couple of people, David was Carrick it? and uh, yeah, Phil Merrick, and yeah. uh, Stupid Girl that was covered as well, and yeah. uh, of course, um, Mother's Little Helper, yeah, that was recorded by a couple of people as well. So there we go. But uh, anyway, Rolling Stones, Beatles, well, yeah, what a period that was. But there we go. Yeah. 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 So now <laughs> I was going to say to you, Wiltshire scene. I know time's running out. I just will say to you. Um, because obviously you're Wiltshire based, I'm Wiltshire based, and yeah. uh, bit bringing the two things together. Um, mm. Peter Daltrey of Kaleidoscope yeah. and Fairfield Parlour is uh, he lives in Devizes still. Um, a, on your show the other day, yeah, he's got an album out with uh, Mark Mortimer and the No Escape, right. and it's a fabulous piece of work. Because I mean, I've known Peter for a few years now, and he's knocking on again, he, yeah. he's not known, but. This yeah. new album, there's such energy in his voice now, and the yeah. arrangements, there's medieval instruments on there, as well as standard string instruments, as well as Mellotron and things like that. Um, absolutely brilliant piece of work. So it's inspiring to me, because even at my age, you see, people can get that moment 
and the the energy and the vibe is with them and it's just fantastic so anyway i recommend that to you and of course kevin robertson's album i dare say you know i do i do indeed yeah yeah it's another fantastic album from from kevin yes but i i will i will uh i will i'll try and get hold of uh uh peter's album as well because uh yeah i, I very much like the the tracks you've been playing yeah well it's streaming so it's easy to you know dip into but yeah i definitely yeah. recommend it yeah Anyway, well, I'll I'll put a program together. I'll send you the the sequence where I put the songs together in our chat, so you've got that, or you can have the program complete, whichever suits you, really, Julian. You know, uh, no skin off my nose either way. And um, I will either put it on the Imaginarium or the Walrus and Carpenter. I'll just see yeah. what how much how long it is when I get it together. Whether it's really or it, yeah. two, and what the, what the feel is. Yeah. Because your music yeah. fits on both programs for me. Okay. <laughs> With the genres you cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so whichever, whichever, yeah, whichever. I mean, it would be fantastic. Roger, thanks ever so much for asking me. I, re I really appreciate it. And it's it's just nice to chat with you anyway, because I, I know we've got so much in common in terms of our music taste. So, uh, well, now, if you're ever around Salisbury, a cup of coffee, and we can, oh. we're sitting and have a good old chat. Absolutely. I, I, I honestly will take you up on that offer one day. I'm working mainly in Somerset at the moment. I working for a different organization now for charity based in somerset um so i, I i'm not really getting to to, to salisbury much but uh, I, I certainly will do that uh, at some point yeah no if, if you get the opportunity it'd be good to meet up yeah one thing i don't know what i'm recording now but um i was just going to mention that we're, um, when i was living in Cheltenham, um uh, me and paul from the band we used to run um a uh, a club night uh, in, in Cheltenham called called aftermath Oh. um and we advertised it you know with a picture of the, the the cover of the album uh and what we'd have is that we'd have bands on you see three bands and then we'd have a kind of uh we'd dj afterwards but just play kind of like classic records from the 60s you know so that was that appealed to a lot of students in the uh in the town you know <laughs> and uh, mm. yeah we did that for a few years well no good stuff i mean yeah i, I could we could talk about the mono and stereo versions of aftermath <laughs> Because I bought the mono version, which at the time I thought, oh, because the stereo wasn't available. But actually, I don't regret it at all. I think it's better. But there we go. Uh, yeah, I've got a mono, and uh, I think it's quite valuable now. So yeah, that's one to hang on to for sure. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, I'm not selling it. No, you're not. It's, <laughs> it's good to know other people appreciate it as well now. <laughs> anyway, Julian, good to talk to you again. You have a lovely Thank evening, you. and uh, yeah, I hope it all so goes much. well at the the, the the Cavern Club in uh, Liverpool. And uh, as soon as I've got something edited together, I'll let you know. All right, mate. That's brilliant. All right. All the best. Yeah, take care now. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah, bye. bye.